We're working on a project to help with elderly. What's needed is a very inexpensive but effective robotic assistant that can just be there to help them out and if they fall, if they have trouble, if they're in pain, if they just need help. Something as simple as recognizing an object is critical. This fearless innovator finds solutions to some of the world's most difficult problems by combining science, technology, engineering, and innovative thinking. Nothing new for him. He's been problem solving since he was a teenager when he concocted enterprising ways to pay for college. Patrick Sullivan, next on Long Story Short. One-on-one -on -one engaging conversations with some of Hawaii's most intriguing people. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Patrick Kevin Sullivan is president and CEO of Oceanit, an internationally recognized company he founded in downtown Honolulu in 1985. He calls it a mind-to-market company that turns scientific principles into real-world applications for real-world problems. His company says he's raised more than $475 million to develop cutting-edge solutions. Oceanet's clients come from around the nation and the world. The company is also entrepreneurial, sending products it develops to the marketplace through spin-out companies, partnerships, or direct manufacturing. Patrick Sullivan employs an intensive process, bringing together curious minds with very different skill sets and encouraging what he calls intellectual anarchy. Would you give us some examples of uh, what products have come about as a result of this, 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 pro this very dynamic process? Well, um, there's a couple. I was on uh, one of our spin outs, IBIS, which is doing uh, energy management in commercial buildings. So we just had a board call and on the way in, I was on the call. And um, that started out with a, um, uh, it's, it's a, a, a healable wireless mesh network, which was a legacy of a technology we built for a military group to look behind walls of concrete and steel and to communicate in really weird places. And so we built that technology, then we thought, okay, how do we do something that's gonna make a difference? And so inside the organization, we have people that are really concerned about energy, greenhouse, carbon. We thought, what if we could use this as a way to mitigate and inform people on energy and commercial buildings turns out to be the market we focused in. We didn't know what the market was in the beginning. So we kind of pivoted from this thing. We built all these tiny antennas and all this kind of electronics and all this stuff in this a software and, and a wireless mesh network. And um, it's become a technology that is like California's using it in a lot of the schools, universities, um, commercial buildings, there are some commercial buildings here, where it'll save 15, 20% of the energy in the commercial building. It starts with the interesting question, and it cascades into these things. And as we gain insights, it opens up these vistas of things that were not thinkable. When you map that process, which I've mapped, and it's called the intellectual anarchy process, it will bring you to some really interesting points and create lots of opportunity but there are things that don't exist. So people have asked me, like in the, um, uh, we, we had this meeting with like 30, 35 of the science advisors to Office of Naval Research. And we kind of walked through how we do this because I, I try to show people what we do, it's not a secret. And they said, well, how do you do this? And because they always start with requirement. We start left to requirement. There, we don't start with a requirement. And I told them, I said, you, you should try this. I said, if you actually ask yourself, what's important and what's interesting. You will find the thing that you should be doing. And I said, we do this fourth quarter of every year. We have these broad conversations in the company. We ask ourselves, what should we do with our time on the planet that are, that's gonna make a difference? Because we're here to impact humans and society. How do we make the world better? What should we be doing? So we pick a few things and every year we do this and those things cascade into these things and it creates all this stuff. That's what intellectual anarchy is. Wow. And uh, it seems like uh, you, all these uh, problems that have resisted answers for time immemorial come in cold, too. I mean, there's so many. You'll never, you'll never st stop with uh, thinking big kind of projects because there are a lot of big things that are unanswered. Yes. And so then it comes down to what should we do? 
what, what might be possible. And so we spend time exploring these things and then we try to pick a few. But, and it takes time as these roll out. But what it does over, over a period of time, it literally creates a pipeline. A pipeline in all these different subjects. So it's not limited by a subject. It's limited by what's important and what's interesting. This process, again, of intellectual anarchy, there's a exploration and discovery phase where you have to be pretty open-minded to where it's going to lead you. It moves into the product phase. You're building real products. And then those have economic value where you can sell, license, you know, do all kinds of things with. A question that you thought might have been, or a project you might have thought was silly at the time, and you've also talked about weird ideas, but, right. but they, they have to be respected, right? Because they can go somewhere. Exactly. And the insights from the silly early stuff turned into, you know, I mean, it's funny. We just had this group here this week from Korea because they want a license for the country of Korea. We're going to do, I think, a pipeline in Turkmenistan this quarter. We're actually going to do heat exchangers in Abu Dhabi. We're starting to do, I mean, this stuff is all just kind of cranking. And it was all invented here and developed in the lab, but the market is the, is the rest of the world. And that's how we view it. So it's interesting because it's such a, it's a fascinating blend of, you know, uh, just sky's the limit, whatever you can do, run with it. And then there all, there has to be some, right. some balance in it. Right. And that's, that's, it, what an art that must be. It is. And um, um, it's funny because my wife is the COO, Jan is, and uh, uh about, so she was an attorney for about 15 years, and then we started doing some spin outs, and I asked her if she could help, and she's really good at it. And um, she, and, and there's a whole operating team that manages stuff, but it's, it is an art um, because you're dealing with things that are messy. Innovation is messy. Right, but it's trying to understand people. And people are very invested in what they've done, too. Right. But she does a really good job of that. And I tell people, it's like businesses are, are either built to manage or built to innovate. But if it's built to manage, innovation is low. If it's built to innovate, management is hard. It's, if it's built to innovate, you got to have the, the way you manage is really important. I can see how it'd be hard to find the right fit at your company because so many people who are very bright and um, educated are into control. You know, they want to control their, their world and they've developed a lot of tools with which to do so. So those, those are the bright, educated people that you don't want. Well, it depends if they're going to become agile and flexible. If they're inflexible, that's a real problem. But if they're flexible, because they may learn a tool set today, but they may be a better tool set tomorrow. And if, they're, if they say, well, I can't do that, that's a real problem. Patrick Sullivan, a resident of Kailua, Windward, Oahu, works with partners and clients throughout the global community, including universities, governments, non-governmental organizations, and businesses. His staff of more than 160 scientists and engineers hails from around the world. He says that living and working in isolated Hawaii with our Hawaiian culture and multiculturalism is a plus, inspiring his team to think outside the box. For manufacturing and certain things, you can build facilities in different places. For the magic, this is the place. See, innovation comes from differences, not sameness. So, getting different people with different perspectives. And we live in this environment here where all kinds of different people live together. That's our strength. So our big strength in Hawaii is the people. And because you don't think you'd be able to get this assortment of people in another place? Well, Feeling comfortable about living here? It's the culture. So the business culture is, is Native Hawaiian. It's we are Hawaiian by culture as a business, the way we work together. It's organically built here from scratch. So it's a, it's a unique culture that is collaborative. We respect each other, but there's lots of debates on the science, on the facts, on the details, on those kind of things. But the culture wouldn't work in other places. It works here. And the people that come here, we recruit from all over, um, that fit into the culture, it works. The DNA of the culture is Hawaiian. It's, it's, uh, it, 
it doesn't exist in Silicon Valley, it doesn't exist in the Beltway. It's just kind of different. I think in the culture of Hawaii is innovation. And I think we forget that sometimes, but the, the, the Native Hawaiians that came to Hawaii, they innovated to get here, they innovated when they got here, they were the first in the country with electricity. They did all these innovations. They were not afraid of electronics, or, or, or I should say, afraid of uh, technology, afraid of change. They embraced it. And to this day, culturally, they embrace people from everywhere. It's just part of our culture. I know you, 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 you do have to bring in a lot of people. I don't know how hard it is for you to recruit locally, but I bet you, you do have some limitations there. Um, what if you did have a whole bunch of PhDs of, of this mindset you could hire? Would that affect your diversity and innovation? The people that grow up here um, who get the good education have a skill set to work with people from all over because they grew up here. And um, we, we found this as kind of an experiment, but we found it really, really works. And so it, it seems kind of crazy. So to, to, to bring a technology to market, you've got um, technology risk, execution risk, and market risk. We focus on technology and execution. Execution risk, we've discovered that if we take uh, sort of local kids or people that grew up here with a good education. We p can put them in any, anywhere in the world. And like we did this scale up in Pennsylvania to put steel casing in the Marcellus shell, which of course we've never done, but we did. And we did this in three months. But to build something like this, you need the, the welder, the, the forklift, guy, the truckers, the, the roughnecks, the roustabouts, everybody who maybe never went to college. Right? Here we've got all these really educated people that work as part of the company. But I told the guys, I said, look, bring aloha. Get to know these people like they're your relatives at Christmas or whatever. Don't be afraid. They don't see guys like you because they're, you know, it's Pennsylvania. And respect their skills. Right. But we work with them, they work with us. And if you do that, it'll be successful. They, cr they crushed it because they brought that human element. And so with the education, which is essential, they were able to bring the cultural piece to work with people that are totally different and be very successful. Who are the rock and rollers? How do you find them? Oh, um, they can go between cultures. Right, so the culture of deep science and the culture. Oh, they're the translators. Right, technology Sherpa. So he's got to go from dealing with the deep science guys and translate that to how it impacts humans and society as a product or a device. Or a and thing. they are different languages? Absolutely. Each industry has its own culture. So they've got to learn the culture and the language of an industry and then translate that back. Because usually the, the scientists and the engineers working on the problem they may think they know what it should do. They're almost always wrong. Because when you start talking to real customers, it's like, oh, that's what you do. And until you get in front of them, until you spend time with them, you just don't understand it. You've got to have those people that are out talking to humans and people in industries and all that kind of stuff all the time. So we do. Those are those, are those people. The human element in the, the culture of Hawaii, I think, enables a lot of that to happen, too. Running a business that's based on innovation and fearlessness can be daunting. Patrick Sullivan notes that not all brilliant, hardworking scientists and engineers who are interested will be a fit for Oceanit. When your um, colleagues describe you, I notice things tend to end in less. Fearless, limitless, endless, <laughs> and relentless. Those are nice things to, to hear. Um, I, I, um, um, See, the, the, especially the older I get, the more I see things are connected. The fields are connected. Um, the the um, uh, things are, people are taught for the convenience of teaching, but in the real world, there's much more things that are connected. And methods and materials change. So think about like um, Wright brothers were kind of bicycle guys and they had canvas and sticks and, and they, eventually build a thing to fly. 
And then people thought, well, what if we use aluminum, right? Or what if we use carbon? What if we use... And over time, what was impossible became possible. And so what I've learned is that, you know, the fields are really connected. And as methods and materials change, what was once impossible becomes possible. And so we do a bunch of that kind of stuff now at OceanEd. And it's a lot of fun. Sometimes it's a little crazy. But um, it unlocks the... Um, uh, you know, we, what I find is that we hire really bright people, but what drives things is what's in here. So we try to connect what's in here with what's in here. And so it's not just the education, it's that connection to doing something that really matters, that makes the magic happen. So how, we, how do you teach that? Well, that's a really, really good question. Um, because a lot of the time when uh, we've got this... Uh, way to work with uh, PhDs, recent grads. And uh, I will usually have a talk once a year with the new ones. And I say, look, you know, we're proud of you. And your mom's proud of you. And you did an amazing thing. But now nobody cares. So what are you going to do? Because now it's all about the rest of your life. And it, it's not limited to that field. It could be anything. So we, we purposely put them in a field or a problem where they may not have any expertise. And they, they, a lot of the time they go through, like, of course, fear. Um, they're worried because here they're the smartest guy. Now they know nothing. But we're trying to get them to get comfortable in the fundamentals. So we, we kind of drive them through this process. So they go back to the basics. And they can look at any problem and start understanding how to think about the problem. And we do that with a, a lot of these young PhDs. Usually it's easier if they're right out of school. Then we kind of unscrew a couple things and then we teach them how to do this. And uh, when they learn to do this, they're a force. And so we've been, and we started with um, uh, a couple young PhDs in aerospace who really learned to get the moves, right? But, but they have to get comfortable in going into something that is way out of their field or whatever without being afraid, but with the fundamentals in, in you know, full grasp of the fundamentals so that they can actually go forward and figure out, okay, I can think about it this way or that way. They know how to, we can look up research information on pretty much anything. So once somebody gets their PhD, then you send them through boot camp. Right. And if they, if they like it, they love it. And if they don't, they hate it, they're terrified. And you usually tell, you right. tell pretty quickly. And we try to find out sooner than later. Because there's no right answer. There's just, we're looking for an answer that works for us. And we want the ones that are just excited. It's kind of like surfing or anything, right? You learn to love it because, yeah, you get hammered sometimes. But when you get the right wave, it's a blast. And I noticed when you've talked about your background and uh, having to go through things, uh, you, you know, I, I think what you, what you were saying is you sometimes... Uh, made a mistake or messed up in business or in some area, but you don't say that. You say, I learned a lot. Right. Yeah. And the way I look at it, as long as you're learning, you're making progress. Because especially when things are really, really hard, it's not going to be straightforward. The reason they're hard is because it's just not that easy. So you're going to get some hits. And what, like when we've done some of these startups and we're interviewing people, I say, look, I just need to know, when you get hit, are you going to get up? Right. Because, because that's the question. It's not whether, and I, was it uh, uh, Rocky Balboa or somebody, it's not how hard you can hit, it's how hard you can get hit and then get back up. And getting back up is a really big deal. Because when we're in this kind of, especially the stuff that we do, people are going to take hits. Nobody wants to, and it's always painful. So anybody that says, Oh, failure, whatever. No, it always smarts, but you got to get up. You've been described as an eternal optimist. Are you? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think you got to be to do this, but I feel blessed in so many ways. So I, I'm, um, I, yeah, I, I think uh, I have a very good um, sense about our future in Hawaii. Uh, and for Hawaii and, in, and for the country and, and other things. And there's issues, always going to be problems, but problems are maybe opportunities in disguise. So I think, um, I think um, in general, things move in the right direction. But to get there, sometimes we take a bunch of turns and 
in, in tacts and directions, which seem kind of crazy, but yeah, I'm an optimist. Your entire business is devoted to problem solving. So you, other people may come home and say, oh, I had a lot of problems today, whereas you, you, that's, that's what you went to work expecting as your, what's on your plate, right? I mean, I, it's a different way to look at problems. Yeah, yeah. But we, we found that, um, for example, if we did what everybody does, why would anybody care about what we do in Hawaii? in the middle of the Pacific. Right. And we do things that nobody thinks are possible. And we break, we have a way to do it. We call, it's a portfolio, interesting, challenging, and disruptive. So we, we break up the world into these three buckets. The disruptive stuff, we're just really, really good at. But um, that's what draws the attention from um, a lot of big companies that we work with because we're thinking way outside of the box. You know, the, the group think that they're all stuck in and the functional fixedness that, you know, they, they can't see it any other way. We're able to kind of get way beyond that and come up with different ways to do things. Patrick Sullivan was always good in math, which started him on the path to becoming an engineer. Growing up, he took whatever job he could find, often convincing prospective employers that he could build anything they needed. After graduating from the University of Colorado at Boulder with a Bachelor of Science degree, he attended the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where he earned a doctorate in engineering. What did you do in your childhood that helped you become who you are today? In my childhood? I mean, did you learn good habits early? Did you, was, did you develop some specialty that helped you along the way later? One thing I learned maybe older than growing up, and what I tell young people, but especially uh, uh, as we're doing tech things here, as I tell people, they have to be comfortable in their own skin. And by that, I don't mean uh, the color of their skin, but who they are. So uh, from Hawaii, there's a sense of saying and, and trying to hide the fact that we're from Hawaii. People go out, try to raise money, try to do things, and um, they want to say, well, you know, uh, we're, we're here in Palo Alto, we're doing all this stuff. And I, I tell them, look, own it, and you're going to find out right away the people that it doesn't matter to are going to work with you. And the people that it does aren't going to help you anyway. So you might as well be comfortable in your own skin because when you are, the authenticity of what you're doing will come through, and you're going to find those people that are going to work with you. And the irony is, from a, in, in building the business over the years, I found that uh, there's this kind of a Hawaiian network in the world. So whenever you come from Hawaii, uh, pretty much no matter where you go, there's people who, from, who used to live in Hawaii or grew up in Hawaii, and they always try to help. It's the craziest thing. But they always come out to help. And, so, and they're everywhere. So it's, um, it's a special thing to be from here. And for what we do, um, it works great. You do so much with automation and uh, artificial intelligence. What do you think Hawaii is going to look like in 2025 when it comes to AI? Well, um, there's, there's going to be change. Not all of it people are going to like. I think um, the biggest issue is in jobs. Uh, for example, drivers. Autonomous cars are, I think, going to make it. And so people that earn a living with driving, that's something we should be thinking about as a community. Uh, the things that we do here that are unique and special to Hawaii are still going to be unique and special here. And uh, the, the, the human contributions in creativity and imagination are still going to be really important. Uh, but in the future, we see um, ag tech, for example. Agriculture in Hawaii could be very successful, but instead of low-cost labor, it's going to be technology. That will, you know, we have terrific sunshine, water, and soil, and uh, producing. So what, then what are the low-cost laborers going to do? Uh, people need to get educated. The people that 
and education becomes a big deal. So making education more available, more affordable is really important. He was named Hawaii Business Magazine's 2016 CEO of the Year for outstanding contributions to Hawaii's economy. Mahalo to Patrick Sullivan, president and CEO of Oceanit in downtown Honolulu and a resident of Kailua, Oahu, for sharing your story with us and giving us a back of the house tour of your offices. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha Nui. How do you relax? Or, or can you relax? Well, no, of course, it's really important. And uh, there's so many things to do here, but obviously one of the big ones is surfing. So surfing is, uh, is a way to reconnect to the world. And it's a totally different environment. Um, everybody is the same, right? And um, the, the, we've, we started this when the kids were small, but more, uh, my mother-in-law would cook dinner and we'd, everybody would show up and we'd go surfing. And so the Monday Night Surf Club, we'd call it. And uh, so we did that for years and years. And it's a great way for everybody, the family, to get together, but to go out and do something and have some fun. And, but yeah, you know, the ocean is a, still a great teacher. And I get in the water, gosh, four or five times a week. Right? So I still enjoy a lot of that. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org.